became Fish and Wildlife Service and DOI. Um, and then uh, it actually, there was another small change in 1956 where it became the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and so there's some debate on sort of when the modern day US Fish and Wildlife Service came into being. You could say it was in the 70s with the passage of the Endangered Species Act. Um, there was also lots of other legislation, environmental legislation, as you all know. Um, but we, uh, we've, we've been around for a long time. The agency has, has changed a lot. Um, and you know, we stand on the shoulders of some pretty, uh, pretty big conservation giants, I would say. Um, Rachel Carson was a biologist for us in, uh, in the early 1930s. Um, and this is Ding Darling up here. Um, he was the first um, director of the Bureau of Bi Biological Survey and helped establish I think over 14 million acres of refuge lands. Um, so pretty cool history. And I, I uh, added a link down here as well for anybody that is interested in learning more. So who, who are we today? Um, well, our mission is working with others to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, and plants and their habitats for the continuing benefit of the American people. And that plants uh, was added to our mission statement um, uh, not that long ago, so, but good to see that that, that has been included. Um, and I highlighted working with others um, because as probably you all know, um, Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, we're, we're, we have a lot of staff, but in the whole scheme of things in the conservation world, um, we, we cannot accomplish our mission alone. Um, and we rely on you guys and lots of other partners um, to help us accomplish our mission. So we have lots of programs within the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and they're not all listed here, but these are the, the big ones, I would say. Um, and we've got fisheries, uh, fish hatcheries, fisheries offices, migratory birds, ecological services, the National Wildlife Refuges, Partners for Fish and Wildlife, Coastal Program. Um, we've also got International Affairs, External Affairs, our Everglades Restoration Program law enforcement, there's a whole suite of programs um, that we have within the agency. We've got somewhere between eight and 9,000 employees across the nation. Um, and we've got, uh, I don't even, five or 600 national wildlife refuges, a bunch of fisheries, fish, fisheries offices and fish hatcheries and ecological services offices. Um, and we are one of two federal agencies responsible for administering the Endangered Species Act. As, long, as well as um, numerous other federal um, laws and, and regulations. But we're, we're mostly gonna be focused on the Endangered Species Act and our administration of that today. So before we sort of launch into what our office has been doing um, in terms of pine, pine rockland recovery um, and endangered species work, I'm gonna introduce you, give you a little bit more background on our team in the office. Um, Many of you probably know uh, our team or most of our team and have worked closely with them. I recognize a lot of names on, on the participant list today, although I haven't met a lot of you in person. So hopefully with more time that will happen um, when we can all uh, do things in person again. Um, but Emily Bauer um, is in our office on my staff um, and she is our Miami Tiger Beetle Recovery Lead. Um, Dave Bender is our botanist, and he's our Pine Rockland Plants Recovery Lead, as well as many other listed plants. Um, Sean Christofferson, uh, he is in our office as well on my staff and is our butterfly lead. Um, I mentioned Rox is our, our field supervisor in the office, and then Kevin Kalis is one of our coastal program biologists that's stationed down in the Keys. Um, so glad to have our whole team together today. Um, and uh, we all are in the South Florida Ecological Services Office. So I, I know that we all have seen this probably many times before, many times this week, but I just wanted to kind of ground us again back into sort of, you know, the, the reasons that the Fish and Wildlife Service and our office um, has gotten uh, involved early on in Pine Rocklands, um, you know, looking at the historical range of what we had in Pine Rocklands in Miami area and South Florida and what remains um, and all of, you know, the threat of this major habitat loss as well as numerous other threats to species 
um, was something that the Fish and Wildlife Service started evaluating at least in the early 80s, maybe even before. Um, but under the Endangered Species Act, one of our responsibilities is, is to look at the status of species and determine whether or not they should be listed as threatened or endangered. So um, that's something that we were doing, um, looking at pine rockland species. Um, and Dave is going to talk a little bit more about that. OK. Can I be heard? Thumbs up if you can hear me. I hear you. OK, very good. OK, uh, I'm Dave Bender. I'm a botanist with US Fish and Wildlife Service in the Vero Beach field office. I've uh, been there since 2008. Um, I'm going to give you a retrospective look at the services work with endangered species. And uh, next, I'm going to start out with the regulatory protections that we've secured for Pine Rockland species through the Endangered Species Act. Uh, this includes provisions against take and harm for animals anywhere they occur, uh, but plants are only protected from harm on federal lands or when federal funding or permits are involved, the so-called federal nexus. Another important ESA regulation, uh, regulatory protection is uh, designation of critical habitat. And we're going to take a look at what we've done so far. 19 pine rockland species have been listed since uh, 1995, uh, 1985 actually. Um, 15 plants, three invertebrates, two butterflies and one beetle, and one small mammal, the Florida bonneted bat, which does use pine rocklands um, to some extent. And as far as critical habitat, we have completed final designations for two pine rockland plants and two butterflies. And we'll, we'll uh, talk more about that in a few moments. So listings have basically occurred in two kind of chronological phases with a service. Back in 1985, um, there was listings that occurred for five pine rockland plants. And these were the crenulate lead plant, tiny polygola, the deltoid spurge, garber spurge, and small milk pea. So those are all uh, Miami Dade um, endemics. And then Following that, there was about a 15 year uh, delay or hiatus while uh, we did other things uh, that were apparently a higher priority. And, and we embarked in 2014 on listing more plants. Uh, and those included the Everglades bully Florida pineland crabgrass, the pineland sand mat, the Florida prairie clover, uh, the Florida brickle bush, and Carter's small flowered flax. Those are all species that are in Miami Dade County pinelands. If we look at the next slide, um, we have uh, also listed sand flax and Blodgett silver bush, which occur both in the Keys and in Miami-Dade, and the big pine partridge pea and wedge spurge, which are endemic to um, the middle Keys, or lower Keys, I'm sorry. Big pine key area, okay. Finally, um, we also listed two butterflies. Uh, both of these, the Florida leaf wing and the Bartram scrub hair screek are dependent on pine rocklands in South Florida. They were both listed and critical habitat was also designated in 2014. 
And the caterpillars of these butterflies feed on pineland croton, a shrub that grows in the understory of pine rocklands. And they were once uh, more numerous and widespread through pine rockland habitat through Miami and Monroe counties, but over time their populations have declined throughout their historic range. And their distribution is now uh, very limited. And unfortunately, at this point, the leaf wing has not been seen outside of Everglades National Park since uh, 2007. And we also listed this little guy, the Miami tiger beetle. And he's endemic to the Pine Rocklands in Miami-Dade County. Originally known from a single collection uh, in North Miami and uh, the, the little bugger hadn't been seen in 70 years. And then in 2007, uh, the beetle was rediscovered in the Richmond Pine Rocklands and is now known to occur in two non-contiguous sites that are likely to represent two populations. And uh, we have a critical habitat proposal currently in process for this species. All right, this sweet looking little guy is the Florida bonded bat. Uh, we listed him actually in 2013 and critical habitat is currently uh, in the, at the proposal stage been published in the Federal Register in 2020. A final will be forthcoming. And the bat uses pine rocklands in Miami-Dade County for both roosting and foraging. And uh, that is where I will turn it back over to Nikki. And she's going to tell you about some of the endangered species recovery projects that there are the other part of what these species get uh, under the Endangered Species Act. So you'll see a number of projects, not all of them, but uh, a number of the ones that we've funded over the last uh, 15 years. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dave. Um, and I, I just have to tell you all that we had a debate in our team of what picture of the Florida bonneted bat to use. The one I had didn't, wasn't cute enough, so we, we landed on the one that you guys saw, which is far cuter. <laughs> um, anyway, so like Dave mentioned, I'm going to give you guys a, a little summary of some of our current and ongoing planning efforts, um, coordination efforts, and then talk uh, more about some recovery um, that we've been able to, to help work towards and achieve um, through our partnerships. So in terms of current uh, efforts, um, we've been coordinating with DOD installations, uh, Sock South and Homestead Air Reserve Base in particular, um, on the revisions to their integrated natural resources management plans. Um, to conserve some of the listed species that occur on those installations, um, as well as talk with them about um, uh, designating critical habitat or critical habitat that has been designated there. Um, so we're, we're actively working with them on those uh, revisions to make sure that they address all of the species needs on those installations. Um, Dave mentioned we've got some critical habitat um, that has been designated for a couple of the species he went over, um, but we are currently in uh, development of a proposal, critical habitat proposals for uh, the eight pine rockland plants that were listed um, since 2014, uh, as well as Miami tiger beetle and Florida bonneted bat. Um, and I forgot to mention earlier that under the Endangered Species Act, under Section 4, when we list a species, um, we are also um, responsible for determining whether or not we should designate critical habitat and, and what that looks like, what's essential for the conservation of the species. Um, so we are, we are working on all of those proposals actively now, and um, you'll, you'll all be seeing those publishing 
likely in the next year, um, either proposed or final rules for all of those species. Um, so we're moving forward on that. Um, we're also working on a recovery plan for all of these pine rockland species, um, except for the bonneted bat, that's going to be a separate recovery plan. Um, but it's going to be focused not only on the species, but also the pine rockland habitat and what's needed to restore uh, pine rocklands in South Florida. Um, the other effort that you guys are going to hear much more about um, next Friday is the pine rockland business plan. Um, which is being led by TNC um, and is a, a collaborative effort among many partners um, that will integrate with our recovery plan um, and complement it nicely, I think. So talking about the recovery plan, um, so this is going to cover um, 18 pine rockland species, um, 15 plants, uh, the two butterflies and the Miami tiger beetle. Um, and I think you've all probably heard us talk about this before in previous talks. This has been, this has been a long time um, in the works, in the making. Um, and our uh, recovery planning process in the Fish and Wildlife Service has actually changed over the last couple of years. So um, it now includes three components. Um, so in addition to the recovery plan, um, we also have to develop species status assessments. Um, and so we are, um, developing those for 18 species. And as you might imagine, that's a pretty big task. So we've actually contracted out to Texas A&M um, to their staff that is solely focused on developing uh, SSAs for the Fish and Wildlife Service. So we've been working with them over the last year um, to develop those drafts. Uh, we have almost all 18 in our office now. Um, so we're going to be moving forward on those pretty soon. Um, and ultimately, those are will go out for peer review. Um, and certainly, we are going to be contacting probably many of you that are on this call um, for to help us with peer review or any other um, review that would be helpful. Um, once we have the SSAs completed, then we'll, those will be a complement to the overall recovery plan for all of these species. Um, and that really looks at the overall conservation strategy for these pine rocklands, pine rocklands and these pine rockland species, uh, identifies delisting criteria for each of the species, identifies and prioritizes recovery actions, as well as estimating the time and cost to achieve those goals. Um, and then the other new component to recovery planning for us is what we're calling the recovery, recovery implementation schedules. Um, so these are more detailed um, uh, documents that talk about uh, really steps it down to what we need to do um, working with our partners to achieve the um, delisting criteria and the recovery actions. Um, and we can actually have multiple recovery implementation schedules um, for, a, for a recovery plan. Um, so we're not, we're not quite sure if we'll have more than one at this point, but um, that will be sort of the last step in the process. Um, but once we have all of these components together, um, those will go out as a, a draft recovery plan and go out for public comment. Um, so we're hoping to have that in the next year. Um, we also have some draft overarching recovery actions for this plan um, for Pine Rocklands, as well as um, species level um, needs. And so you kind of see the four main categories here. Um, these are definitely um, open to uh, suggestions and um, more ideas and more input. Um, but this is kind of where, where our starting point has is and has been. Um, and one of the really interesting things I think is um, had looked back at what we had drafted a few years ago um, and we hadn't focused as much on um, restoring pine rockland habitat um, and more on, you know, looking at the existing pine rocklands and, you know, protecting and managing those um, with less emphasis on the need to, that, th that it's not enough um, and that we need to restore additional areas. So that's something that we um, are adding, adding in there. Um, and it's something that I know that everybody has talked about um, on, on the calls this week. And I think we, we're, all, we're all recognizing that are, there's just not enough pine rockland out there right now 
um, to really recover these species. So we, we really need to be restoring more. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview of some of uh, recovery through partnerships um, that I, I mentioned, you know, we have so many partners and all, everybody that's on, on the call today, plus more I'm sure um, that have been helping um, and really integral to um, research and monitoring and management of these species in Pine Rocklands um, and as well as um, uh, really helping us sort of move the needle on some recovery actions. Um, and I should mention um, that even though we don't have an official recovery plan, it doesn't mean that we're, you know, we're not doing recovery or we can't be working on recovery actions. So um, these are just really great examples, I think, of some of the great recovery work that's going on. Um, so back as, you know, over 25 years ago, um, Fairchild was mapping and surveying the, the originally listed pine rockland plants. Um, so um, the Fairchild has been a, a great partner for us for a really long time, um, helping to really expand the knowledge about these species um, and, uh, you know, produce uh, reports and, and really new information and new scientific understanding, um, for example, the life cycle of polygola small i. Um, and these were projects, this particular project was funded through um, section six through FDAX. Um, and I think Jennifer probably mentioned uh, in more detail this earlier this week. Unfortunately, I missed your talk, Jennifer, but um, another great example of a long-term um, project and collaboration is with Crenulate Lead Plant. Um, and I, uh, Dave tells me that it's a, it's a project that has, you know, had some challenges over the years, um, but there are still surviving plants 25 years later um, and some, you know, some good things um, that have come from the, that project or those projects. So um, great work on, on this particular species. Um, there's also a num number of really recent or current uh, or even some brand new um, projects that we've been working with um, IRC on. Um, the Pine Rockland Initiative was, has been funded through our coastal program for uh, the last couple of years. Um, and so far, there's been 300 acres of restoration in uh, Miami-Dade and Florida, Florida Keys. Um, we've also funded post-Irma post fire fuel reduction um, on Key Deer Refuge, as well as some Pineland cro Croton planting and assessment um, through uh, National Wildlife Refuge funding. And then this year, um, Luckily, um, we were able to secure some funding um, for a project uh, doing some habitat management at the U.S. Coast Guard property uh, in the Richmond Pinelands. So we're really excited um, to get that moving forward. Um, the, another highlight um, has been the endangered keys plants reintroduction um, in No Name Key. Um, that's been um, great work by Fairchild. Um, with funding through section six. Um, and uh, that's something I know Dave has, has talked with Jennifer about a lot and, and been in the loop on and been involved with. So um, there's, a, you know, it's a, a relatively new project, but there's really good, um, good signs that things, things are going well. Um, and hopefully this will, this will be um, an introduction, reintroduction that, that sticks for some of these plants. Um, and then I already kind of mentioned the Pine Rockland business plan um, and, you know, core partners are Miami-Dade County, IRC, Fairchild, uh, led by TNC, uh, we're, we're involved as well. And um, you will be hearing a lot more about that uh, next Friday, I believe. And so, um, you know, we, we are optimistic about the future of Pine Rocklands. Um, there's, there's immense pressures, as we all know, on the system, um, the ecosystem, but, uh, you know, working, working with all of our partners uh, on the projects that we have been able to achieve so far, as well as future plans in terms of recovery planning and this bit conservation business plan, um, and other great projects um, for reintroductions and 
management uh, and prescribed fire. Uh, it's, it's, it makes us optimistic for the future that we can accomplish what, what we need to to recover these areas. Um, and these are uh, some of our, I guess, sort of take home messages um, and lessons learned. Uh, and I don't think these are, are new or different from anything anybody else has shared this week. Um, but I think that speaks a lot because we were all really, I think, focused on, you know, the, the really essential things. Um, so we know that prescribed fire is essential for long term success. It's challenging, um, but we, we've seen it done, we've seen it implemented, and we know it can be accomplished. So that's a, a really um, optimistic, I think, and, and hopeful. Um, and partnerships, like, I can't say enough about partnerships and uh, being critical for long-term success. And, um, and we also know that recovery of pine rockland species requires more habitat than what we've got now. Um, and really talking about converting returning the prior converted lands to Pine Rockland is essential to, to extend, expanding that footprint and uh, being able to achieve recovery of these species. We, we don't think we can do it without, without doing that. And so um, we kind of want to wrap this up with a, with a few thank yous. Um, and before I do that, um, I also wanted to mention there's there's so many projects that we could have listed here, and I know you've already heard about a bunch of them this week, um, and you know it's just I think too many to cover. Um, but the other projects, you know, we've been working. I know the county I'm working closely with Miami Dade County on Miami Tiger Beetle surveys, um, work on bonneted bat, uh, establishing bat boxes at Zoo Miami. Um, doing acoustic surveys in those areas, um, just, you know, lots of really good work going on and we appreciate um, all of the, the efforts and, and collaboration that we have with everybody on these projects. Um, so I want to end this um, before we before we launch into questions um, by thanking um, and recognizing one of our former colleagues in the office, um, Mark Salvato. I think ma many or most of you know him. Um, so probably many of you know him well. Um, and as you probably know, he retired um, from the Fish and Wildlife Service back in February. Um, and while we had our office recognition, we thought this would be a perfect opportunity um, to recognize him in this group. Um, because he's been so integral um, to butterfly research and conservation and pine rockland conservation in general for over 20 years. So you can see some of the sentiments that um, several folks sent in uh, to share with us. Um, and I just want to say that um, it was a privilege to work with Mark. Um, we, he made us all better in the office and um, really miss working with him. His uh, un unparalleled expertise and dedication and passion for pine rocklands and butterflies um, gave us all hope in the office for sure. And, um, you know, it's, it, I think, speaks a lot for the future of pine rocklands. And he's just one of many um, that are so dedicated and passionate to this ecosystem and um, the species that occur there. So, Thanks to Mark um, for everything he did while he was a Fish and Wildlife Service employee and colleague. Um, I know we really miss him, but I know he's enjoying his retirement too. Um, and then finally, uh, just a thanks again to all of our partners. And if we missed you, I apologize. Um, we did not, in, you know, intentionally leave anybody out. So um, tried to cover cover all of our bases, but it's possible we might have missed somebody, but we really appreciate everyone um, working together on these uh, Pine Rockland efforts. So with that, um, we are ready to take any questions you guys have. So Nikki, there were some questions uh, in the chat and I will um, quickly read some off to you. Okay. Um, what financial resources are available from the service to assist in restoring uh, Pine Rocklands? And I know you discussed some of those that we've already um, provided, but if you wanna dive into that a bit more. 
Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of resources. Um, our coastal program is a is a prime example, um, and Kevin can can definitely talk more about that if he wants to. Um, we've provided um, funds through our office. Um, end of year funds, for example, um, this year is what we were able to put towards um, the new project on the U.S. Coast Guard site. Um, so there's there's money. Sometimes, um, not always, but uh, luckily this year we had some funding available to put towards that. And these are these are high priority projects for us, for sure. Um, that I mentioned section six, monies that come through um, the state uh, go towards, uh, have been going towards a lot of these um, research and monitoring projects as well. Did I miss anything you guys? Please feel free to jump in. Yes, just to uh, jump in real quick. I think, you know, the prior converted um, lands will be, you know, it's going to be a process. It's going to be needing to do some pilot projects um, to figure out what's possible, what's feasible, what the tools are out there for us to, you know, um, get rid of what's already on the landscape and, and make the land uh, suitable for the plants that we want to that we want to have grow there to to become at least a reasonable approximation of pine rocklands with the with the you know understanding that we might not achieve you know the exact definition or description of a pine rockland so it's going to be you know starting out small figuring out what the what the methods are establishing some proof of concept and and then um, getting you know getting people excited about it and hopefully um, you know once we move through and develop and finalize the business plan that will also help us to direct energy and resources to to some some of these areas that that could that are in need of improvement um, and generate interest in funding because. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be some work, and it's going to be, and it's going to be costly. But um, as we've come to understand, um, letting Pine Rockland transition and get out of hand without fire, without treatment, um, is costly as well to so get it back to where it needs to be. So um, we're we're going to do everything we can to find the reason to do the work and to find the money to do the work. Yeah, and I also should have mentioned we also have some other um, internal Fish and Wildlife Service funding opportunities usually every year. Um, one through our refuge system uh, or joint with our refuge system and ecological services, the cooperative recovery initiative um, funds that are directed towards listed species recovery. Um, and we've been able to secure some of that funding actually for the last couple of years down in the Keys for Miami Blue uh, butterfly uh, work. Uh, there's also the Recovery Challenge Grant. That's another um, source of funding that comes through our headquarters office um, that is directed towards species um, either on the brink of extinction typically or um, that would be funding actions that would help lead to um, either a delisting or a, or a downlisting for a species. Okay, thank you, Nikki and Kevin. I'll get to another question here. Um, so there was some questions asking about uh, what areas are being designated critical habitat for the Florida bonnet bat, and uh, that was in the chat, and that was also answered in the chat with um, a link to our eco site where you can find the proposed uh, critical habitat um, document in there, and that's also list uh, link is on our screen right now. Um, second one from the bottom. Um, following with that, the question says, is the Richmond Pine Rockland area a part of that? Again, uh, I, I, I haven't read that, that document yet, but I would go and encourage you to, to look at that on the site. Uh, Nikki, if you want to have a more direct I answer to that. 
Yeah, I can answer that, Sean. Um, it is uh, Richmond Pine Rockland area was not part of the proposed critical habitat rule that published in June. Um, however, we did get um, lots of public comments on that area, as well as a number of other areas across South Florida. So we are currently reviewing all of those comments um, and uh, summarizing those and figuring out um, what, which direction to go um, if there you know, will be any edits to the, to the final rule based on comments. We also had peer review comments on, on the rule as well. Well, thank you. And uh, another question, this one uh, regards uh, the studies. Can we speak to the studies being done on the Miami Wilds property? I know we've asked for a number of different things. Um, you may, may have a more uh, specific uh, list of things that were, were asked. And so maybe you can just elaborate on that. Yeah, I can mention a few things and I, I might miss something. So Emily um, or Rox, uh, please feel free to, to add if, you, if I miss something. Um, but they are doing, uh, are or will be doing uh, surveys for Miami Tiger Beetle. Um, we, are, we have discussed um, doing uh, additional acoustic surveys for Florida Bonneted Bat in that area. Um, and Sean, I can't remember about butterflies, if that was something we requested or at, recommended. You're on mute, Sean. Yeah, I think, I think they already uh, did some um, sort of uh, surveys for Croton in and around the area. Um, so I don't know if there's any additional surveys for that to be readily necessary. Uh, that's all the questions I think that were in the chat. Uh, oh, Bartrams is in the area. Yes, we know Bartrams is in the area. Um, um, so uh, yeah, we know Bartrams is in the area. We have surveys around the area and within uh, some of the area for Croton. Um, I don't know if there's any additional surveys that we would um, need or require for, for that specific project. I know that we do not have a final project in our office for review, so we're not able to really comment about that project specifically right now. As of right now, it's, it's in preliminary discussions with the county, and until we get a final project to review, um, you know, there's really not much that we can we can say to the project. Hey, this is Rox. Can I just add that the county's been really excellent about coming in and asking for technical assistance um, early on, and so we're providing our technical assistance as the county is doing their review process. Um, so I think that's. Probably one of the most important things to know is that it's an ongoing and interactive um, collaborative discussion at this point. Thank you, Rox. Um, let's see, S several. So this was a, a comment in the in the chat, it's not necessarily, well, there is a question to it, that several uh, several uh, populations of linum have been identified on one of the coastal levees. Is the service aware of this? Dave, I think I chatted you yep. um, to see if you knew that. Yeah, um, I think I can speak to that to some degree. Um, we haven't published the proposal yet, but uh, the way we're developing it now is those uh, two populations of Arenicola are uh, in a um, pretty novel habitat for the species. Um, I don't think there was ever a pine rockland there. Uh, I, I believe the origin of, of those plants on those levees, and uh, I think others share this opinion, is probably uh, when they took the material from rock plowed pine rocklands 
to make those levees uh, way back when uh, they brought the seed bank along and the apparently it was Sandflex was very successful and uh, there's you know at, at least one of those levees has like tens of thousands of plants uh, we're, we're aware of that but it's what we really want to protect through critical habitat is like the habitat we want them to be in and that's that it creates a problem with uh, these ones that are in these kind of novel habitats um, and they're not really areas where restoration is likely to be a thing so those are the reasons why at this point we have we're not looking seriously at those sites for critical habitat however they do have any you know and all the other protections that come with the esa um those populations uh, those aren't discounted by the fact that they're in this novel habitat um but it's not the best fit for critical habitat is is kind of the best question i can give you right now does that help um so there's another question in here and and maybe uh Leslie, if you want to elaborate on your question, because I'm not sure I fully understand what you're you're asking. Um, maybe others do. Um, I was told an extension of time was given to 12 months for the property. I'm assuming you mean the Miami Wilds property. Um, would that be sufficient time? And so sufficient time for, um, you know, is that, are you asking, is that sufficient time for the county to come up with a proposal then, oh, for a complete study? Um, I'm not aware. I don't know specifics uh, for a lot of the studies that were requested. So um, I'm assuming that uh, whatever whatever studies that were asked, the appropriate amount of time, you know, was uh, was discussed to accomplish those studies. I don't see any more in there. If anyone has any other questions, please use the chat or feel free to unmute your mic and, and ask a question. All right, Jennifer says we've answered all the questions. So I'm assuming there's no more in the chat and no one's, no one's unmuted themselves. So thank you everyone right. for joining. Nikki, do you have any closing uh, remarks? Nope, other than thanks for joining us. And if you have more questions um, that you you wanna or wanna know more detail about anything that we talked about today, um, please feel free to contact any of us and, and we can chat more. Thanks Hold everyone. Oh. Thanks everybody. We'll post a recording too. Thanks, Thank Jennifer. You, Thank you, Jennifer. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It was awesome. Thank you. <laughs>